Is it working now? <laughs> Sorry, everything went wrong on my computer at once. It was fantastic. First, my microphone didn't want to hook up, so I got a different microphone. Uh, hope that's working out. Then, uh, my Wi-Fi didn't want to connect, so I had to fix that. Um, let's see. Anybody out there? Hello, Linda. Glad we're working. I'm going to drink coffee. I feel like I've earned it. Hey, Gene, how's it going? Sue, how are you? Hey, Grace. All right. Well, I am Pastor Goodman again, not Pastor Borghart. He's in a meeting, so you're stuck with me. Uh, <laughs> hey, Bobby Joe. Good afternoon, Steve. Hey, Nathan. Cheryl, great to see you, too. All right. Uh, I was told that Pastor Borghart left you off at John chapter 5. Hey, Maggie. Terry Lynn, how's it going? So let's uh, switch over. Uh, <laughs> hey, Sandra, thanks for having me. Good afternoon, Corinne, Norman Davis. How you doing? Uh, we're going to dive into uh, John chapter 5 today. So I'm going to put myself over here. We're going to read through a little bit of this, the, uh, the text, and then we will we'll dive into it. Uh, I'm going to pick up at John uh, chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. We'll read a, uh, a little bit uh, until I feel like not reading the official way to do it, and, and then we'll talk about it. Uh, so here we go. Uh, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, a pool in Aramaic called Bethsaida, which or, uh, it was five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there, and he knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. Let's, uh, let's stop there. We'll go into uh, John chapter 5 uh, through the Sabbath day. Boop. Here we go. Uh, welcome to my ADHD. Let's do this thing. So, uh, the, the thing that I can't sort of ignore is uh, that, that obvious question that, that Jesus has in the red letters, because you know them's the important ones. Uh, do you want to be healed? <laughs> no, Jesus, I'm, I'm, I'm good. It's been 38 years. Uh, I think I'm finally getting used to it. If we could just go ahead and leave things as they are uh, with me being an invalid, I think that would be fantastic. Really? Um, Jesus isn't being obtuse. Um, the problem is where you look for help. Do you want to be healed? Well, a want clearly hasn't been enough. The man for 38 years, 38 years, I'm not 38 years old. For 38 years, he's been trying to get down that pool and somebody's hopped in front of him in line every last bit. Uh, people are cutting, it's rude. And uh, this man's desire and his ability to be healed uh, are, are clearly not coinciding. And this is actually how he answers. Uh, the man does not answer by the mercy of God or by the grace of God, but simply by the law. Um, he, he simply says, look, I've been trying to get healed. Uh, I, I've got no one to put me in the pool when the water stirred up, and every time I try to get down there, somebody hops in line ahead of me. Uh, when, when we want to deal with uh, the, the reality of, of creation only based on the law, it's very quickly going to show us that we are inept. It's very quickly going to show us that we're sinners. Uh, this man very much does want to be healed. It's just that the want isn't enough. And that's an important thing, uh, because there's a, a strain of Christianity, uh, especially in America, that uh, sort of 
would leave Jesus to, to mean it, um, well, if you really wanted to be healed, you would be by now. I mean, like, if you really put your, your mind to it, your faith to it, your, your prayers to it, you'll get everything that you want. Uh, it, it's the prosperity gospel that actually works out really well if you're already rich, but um, nobody's actually probably, just by the desire alone, managed to make themselves rich. Uh, the problem when we want to just sort of answer Jesus' question by the law alone is that it leaves us with very little but the prosperity gospel. If you really want it, well, name it and then claim it. Uh, pray your way into healing. Pray your way into wealth. Pray your way into everything that you really want all along. But the problem is, inside of all of this, you know who we kind of forgot to talk about? Um, Jesus? That's bad. That, that That's probably not ideal. Um, but it's, it's very much our favorite thing to do. Uh, it's a first commandment issue. It, it, thou shalt have no other gods before me issue uh, that you see alive and well inside of the prosperity gospel. Uh, what they do, it's very tricky. The prosperity gospel is full of idolatry. But they always name their idols Jesus. That's tricky. See, if Jesus only exists to get me the healing for my disease, if Jesus only exists to get me money, if Jesus only exists to get me the things that I wanted all along, well, then Jesus is kind of a vending machine. And the thing that you're actually after isn't Jesus at all. It's the thing that you want. Does Jesus exist for more than just to heal this one guy because he, he, he really wants it? Um, the, the problem with the prosperity gospel like that is that it, it discounts, first and foremost, the God who would give you things you don't want but need, like forgiveness of sins. Uh, because I don't want forgiveness of sins. What I very much want is an excuse to keep on sinning. What I very much want is a justification for my actions. What I very much want is to use my sins for the betterment of myself and... Uh, if that happens to hurt my neighbor, that, well, he's going to have to name and claim his way out of the pain that I caused him. And it will really just sort of be a every man for themselves kind of religion, which isn't a communion at all. In fact, it's every old Adam for himself. If you want to do this based on your wants, recognize your wants will not always coincide with your neighbor's wants. And your wants will not always coincide with the things that the Lord has called good inside of his law. And also, your wants will not always coincide with the things that are possible. I want to be six foot four. Ain't gonna happen. Uh, and, and that's sort of the cheeky ones. But I've I've watched people uh, in, in various frustrations, struggles, pains of this life, suffering, not because they just really wanted to, but because they didn't have any other choice at all. The question isn't, does God give you everything you want? The question is, where is God when you are suffering? Here the answer is actually pretty simple. Um, he's right there talking to the man who's suffering. So the invalid, the sick man, answered Jesus, I can't. I have no one to put me in the pool when the water stirred up. I cannot make my neighbor stand in line. I can't. So where is God? Well, he's right there saying, resurrect, rise, get up. See, Jesus uh, speaks a, a potent word. Uh, th this, this idea of um, get up, it, it's the same Greek word uh, that, that's going to show itself up uh, in this whole rising from the dead thing in the same chapter. He's not simply saying, you know, stand on your own two feet, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. If you really, really mean it, just, you know, do it. He's saying, you are risen from the dead. And if you are risen from the dead, this is who you are now. Walk. You're somebody who walks now, so be somebody who walks. Become whole. Become resurrected. Take up your bed and walk. Uh, and it's, it's a potent thing because, as it turns out, when God speaks, he tends to get his way. So um, at once, because Jesus spoke, the man was healed. He took up his bed and he walked. And it doesn't actually say that he went down into the pool of Siloam and washed himself according to the right that would heal. Um which is a frustrating thing to a Lutheran who very much sees the pool that uh, heals, uh, the, the water that gives new life a, a, as a, a, a baptism motif. And I want to say, he's better. Baptism should do this because I very much want to trust in my baptism. But I've also got this problem where 
I try and use baptism as opposed to receive baptism. See, Luther doesn't actually tell you to use your baptism. He tells you to remember your baptism uh, by making the sign of the cross uh, every time you wake up and every time you go to bed. See, baptism isn't a way to sort of make God do your will. The pool of Siloam isn't a way to, to sort of, God doesn't want to heal anybody, but if you know the secret, you just hop into this pool. Um, <laughs> What, what deities hate them uh, because they found the way to, to make them do what they want. God's will is to heal. God's will is to save. God's will is to resurrect, even as he speaks it here, get up. So Jesus isn't circumventing the washing. He's showing what the source of its power is. Uh, this isn't simply... Uh, if you have baptism, you don't need Jesus, or if you have Jesus, you don't need baptism. It's that they're the same. What is it that's in the water that makes it a baptism? Well, baptism is not just plain water, but it is the word of God in and with the water which does these things. The word of God, which this gospel, John chapter 1 tells us, is named Jesus. Jesus is in the water. That's why your baptism is a baptism. If there were no Jesus in that water, it would just be wet. But if Jesus is in that water, well, then you who, in the midst of your frustrations, in the midst of your pains and sufferings, haven't had the Lord walk up to you and simply say, yeah, stop that, get up and, and walk, well, you're not disconnected from God. It's not an either or. Because Jesus is at the center of your baptism. And so the same Jesus who speaks to this man, resurrect, take up your bed and walk, is the exact same Jesus who spoke to you in your baptism and said, resurrect. Take up your bed and walk. This, the core power behind these healings is always the God who conquers death. And this is an important thing to consider, um, especially when we sort of have the miracles of Jesus. Uh, the miracles of Jesus are always wonderful for other people. I hate that <laughs> because I'm, I'm very selfish. The miracles of Jesus are always wonderful for other people that aren't me, but I'm the one who, who needs this thing right now. Uh, and so it, it's fantastic if you can point to the Jesus who healed a paralytic, except don't do that to a paralytic because paralyzed. When we sort of divorce the healings from the salvation that God gives, you can say very much, God so loved the whole wide world, but how come he didn't heal it? When you very much divorce the healings from the resurrection, uh, it, it almost starts to make this, the resurrection seem like a secondary prize. You know, this is, this is, the, this is the participation medal, uh, but if you were really, really a good Christian, you'd get healed. Again, it all falls back on works if you let it. Uh, it's very much how old Adam wants to do religion. A and so... Don't divorce the healing from the salvation because they, they are actually tied to each other. Um, every single healing miracle that Jesus does is tied to the cross where he died to sin and rose to righteousness. Recognize this, um, that, that especially as Jesus adopts the language of resurrection as he heals this man, it's because the healing and the resurrection are not disconnected. If Jesus heals this man with resurrection language, rise, uh, be well, be whole, take up your bed and walk, it's because the, the two are addressed at the same point in time and space. See, miracles aren't just sort of random things that God does along the way. It's not just sort of like a, a symptom of being God. The miracles have a cost. For this man to have his paralysis undone, that means the sin behind it also has to be undone. That was done at the cross. Every single miracle has a cost. It's just that Jesus gathers not only all of the sins of the world, but also all of the sicknesses, all of the diseases, all of the wages of sin, all of the deaths unto himself. And he bears it out on the cross and breathes his last, and he dies to sin that we would rise. And so if you haven't received your healing yet, recognize that your healing and your resurrection are not disconnected. Sometimes you get a foretaste, and that's great. But it's not disconnected from the real thing which is why we go to church. We go to church to eat and drink the body and blood of Jesus, the foretaste of the feast to come. And you get a little foretaste of the resurrection of the body. Every single time you come to church, you receive his gifts, forgiveness, life, salvation given to you in body and blood. This is not a replacement for the resurrection. This is the resurrection being given to you. Now you've got a little glimpse of it, but there is more yet coming. Hey, Pastor Borgard, how are you doing? Um, <laughs> every single miracle, 
that, that Jesus does. It is tied to this resurrection. Understand that. That even if you have not yet received the healing that you want, you've received communion, which is the healing that you need. It's the healing that ties you to the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting, where even if it's not as quick as you want, like, I don't know, 38 years too slow, like this guy, it's coming because Jesus has already paid for it. It's not a just wait. It's a see it's already been paid for. It's coming. It's been paid for already because the cost of the miracle was undone. Jesus will later actually talk about this uh, when he says, uh, see, you are well now, you are whole now. Sin no more that nothing worse would happen to you. Um, and it, it's, it's, I'm going to jump down on the, the ADHD flow chart. Uh, we'll, we'll come back around to the Sabbath day. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. Uh, my head's in the way. Go away, head. Here we go. Oh, come on, listen. There we go. So we're going to talk about this later. I want to say it's John 8. Uh, so you'll probably have Pastor Borghart for that. Uh, when, when the man is born blind and the disciples are like, well, who, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? And I'm not going to give that away. Uh, but instead, I'm going to say, look, sometimes when you, when you sin, you can immediately see what it broke. Sometimes when you murder somebody, there's a dead body right there. And I can say, yep, that, that got broke. Sometimes I actually have to be told something is sinful because I, for the life of me, can't see what actually came about. And so I come up with terms like victimless crime to masquerade my sins as righteousness, or, or at least, you know, not, not so unrighteous. Uh, sometimes you can see what got broken the sin. Sometimes you can't. And sometimes the sin is so ground into the dust of creation from sins of Adam, the sin of Adam that you're never actually going to figure out whose fault it is. All you can say is, this isn't, this isn't good. Jesus says to this man who was invalid and is healed, sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. Um, and here he doesn't actually do the thing that we want to do and say, it's your fault that you are paralyzed. He, he doesn't say, it's your fault that you're paralyzed. He says, sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. That isn't a, because you sinned once, you got punished, and if you sin again, you're going to get it worse. It's a recognition that sin breaks stuff, and uh, it causes even more damage than paralysis. Sin breaks stuff, which is why our Lord tells us to abstain from sin, flee from sin. Do not rush into this. Uh, shall we sin that grace may abound? Romans 6, by no means. But that's not a, it's your fault, and it will be your fault again. It's just a recognition that you have a new identity now. Because this is actually how the Lord bestows this. He doesn't just say, sin no more. He says, look at who you are now. He, he Romans sixes him. <laughs> he, uh, let, let, let's peek. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died to sin has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. The, the recognition that we are free from sin isn't a challenge. It's an identity. It's not a, if you sin too much, your baptism doesn't count. It's a, you are alive in Christ. Remember who you are. Remember your baptism. You are whole. You are well. You are right now the new man. Just be what you are. Shall we keep on rushing back into death? Well, I don't know. Should this man who is freshly not paralyzed jump off a building and become paralyzed again? How did that work out? Like, how how did that feel? Uh, when, when we were addressed before the Lord. He never simply says, now that I died for you, you know, just have lots of fun and do whatever you feel like. He, he in fact, doesn't say, be the individual who has wants that go against my will and your neighbor's wants. He, he says, be alive. You are well. This is a gift. This is who you are now. Don't rush back into the things that bring death. Don't rush into the things that bring something worse than this paralysis. First comes the identity. 
and from that identity flows everything else. If you want to do this thing based on anything other than God's bestowing of an identity, all you have is a bait and switch. A, a religion that doesn't actually forgive, but, but only sort of ropes you in, ties you to something, like the, the hope of, of something at least, and then says, now keep doing these things or you won't actually get it. That's, that's not Christianity. Uh, that's, that's what they warned you about when you had to sit through dare lessons in, in school, uh, that the first hit is always free, uh, and after that they start charging you. Um, your Christianity should not follow the same business model as drug dealers. I'm just putting that out there. Uh, the first hit is free, a a and after that, uh, no, just stop. <laughs> You're baptized. You are wholly alive in Christ. Be holy, because God makes you holy. We're going to start to see what this is, too. This man's identity came from God's word. It's not that God said, rise, and the man's like, ah, that's a great idea. You're right, I do want to rise. And then he decided on his own, completely apart from God, to rise. No, it was that God's word actually made him something different than he was. And then the consequences of it simply followed. You see, the good works are done by God through you. The good works that, that are called for are, are a gift that God would bestow upon his creation. And he would even let you be a, a, part, a, a, a giver of a gift that you couldn't do on your own. Uh, it, it's like when I, I let my kids buy birthday presents for each other. Like, I have to buy the thing. And then I'm like, all right, what do you want to get your brother for birthday? And, and she goes to the store. And here, she, she gets to be the giver. She gets to see uh, him receive something wonderful. And she gets to actually get all of the credit for it. She didn't pay for that. I bought him the Nerf gun. And then he shot me with it. But this is grace. And it's wonderful. Um, and... Uh, bringing it back around. Uh, it happened on the Sabbath day. Uh, take up your bed and walk. Where are we? Um, and that day was the Sabbath. It's an important part about what the Sabbath is. The Sabbath day uh, is not simply a day of rest. I know that's what Sabbath means. But you have to actually recognize what rest is. Come to me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I shall give you rest. Rest isn't found in doing no work. Rest is found in Jesus. Who is your rest? Your Sabbath rest. Uh, it's actually given in the third commandment itself. Remember the Sabbath day, not by doing nothing. Not even remember the Sabbath day by resting. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. So how are you going to rest your way into holiness? Holiness, remember the, the complete lack of uncleanliness. The, the absolute righteousness, the nothing is wrongness. Uh, I've, I've actually been given the, the gift every once in a while, uh, not in Texas anymore. Those are gone. And maybe not even with COVID anymore because now we have virtual learning. But back when I was little, back in my day, we had this thing called a snow day. We're going to have to explain that to our kids someday. Woe to us. The snow day might just be gone, not just for Texans who don't get snow, uh, but for everybody even in the parts of the country with actually four seasons, uh, where it might now snow a foot and everything would stop and your teachers are going to be like, no, don't go outside and have fun. Everybody load up Zoom. And now, now your snow day is ruined. Back in my day, we used to have snow days, and they were glorious. The best snow days weren't like the two inches of snow where you still had to go out and scrape and get to work, and you were just everything was miserable and cold and wet. The very best snow days are the ones where it dropped like a foot of snow and everything shut down, and there was nothing to do. Like, you were not getting out from under this thing, so you might as well just wait a little bit. So we would watch all of the Star Wars movies, and it was a wonderful day. We rested. Uh, we, we, we ate junk food. And we watched Star Wars, and I loved it. And it was the best snow day. Uh, but I never actually got holier from it. In fact, by the end of the day, all I really kind of felt was grungy. Um, this is the thing about binge watching. You, you recognize this, right? You don't feel better or healthier or holier or, or purer after all of it. You just sort of feel cruddy. Nobody is actually made holy by resting. That's like trying to clean a table with a dirty rag. How are you going to apply holiness with something that is unclean? How are you, by sitting around in your own uncleanliness, going to all of a sudden become holy? If you're going to remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, it can't be about what, you, what a bunch of unholy people do. It's got to be about what, what, what something holy does for you. So if you want to clean a table, you get a clean rag. 
and clean it with that. So our Lord becomes our holiness. After all, this is why he, he instituted the Sabbath day. On the sixth day, seventh day, he wasn't tired. <laughs> He's God. He can do all that. And it wasn't even that Adam was tired. Adam's one day old at this point in time. And this is before the fall. It's not even sin yet. The, the, the Adam who, who can actually run and not be weary gets the first Sabbath day. And it's not because he needs rest. It's because God actually wants to spend time with Adam. God actually wants to impart gift to man and woman. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. And Luther capitalizes this uh, on this in the Catechism. And so he doesn't talk about rest at all. He says simply, we should fear and love God that we do not despise preaching and his word, word, Jesus, but hold it sacred and gladly hear it and learn it. You can do the Sabbath day by your works or by God's works for you. And it's a radically different day. This is what Jesus wars with the, uh, the, the Jews over. Uh, on the Sabbath, over and over and over again. Uh, you see it even as the text is introduced. Uh, in John 5, 1 uh, and 2, there are, there are sort of references. Uh, they're, they're subtle, but they're there. Uh, this was a feast of the Jews where Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And it doesn't actually name the feast, but there, there's reason to kind of suspect that it was Passover. Um, you can do the Passover by your works or, or by God's. Uh, and so you can do a, a Seder meal. Uh, don't do a Seder meal, guys. Understand this. Like, I, I, I grew up Jewish. I, dibs. Um, but, but whenever I see one of you Gentiles uh, try and, and do a Seder meal, it, it's, I swear, it, it's like buying your kids a really expensive Christmas present and then watching them just play with the box. You guys get the fulfillment of the Seder. You get the Lord's Supper. You get the meal that was instituted on that night. You don't need to play act at the Seder. <laughs> you have the actual gift. Let the box go. But the real Seder, the real Seder takes a long time. Um, and the only person who actually has fun is the head of the household because he has to drink like five cups of wine by the end of it. And, uh, well, it's kind of fun to watch the head of the household drink like five cups of wine about it. Uh, but the last time we did that as a family, Grandma got really, really, really mad at my dad. So that's another story for another day. Anyway, uh, you can do the, pa the Passover Seder by your works and say, God, look at what I've done for you. I ate some matzah and some bitter herbs. And now, now I am holy What because I, I leaned on the table instead of um, instead of sat down uh, and and ask the, the the liturgical question why is this night different from all other nights uh, but rather understand that the most impressive thing that was done on the Passover was never done by the people but by the Lord who sent an angel of death that passed over those who were marked by the blood of the lamb and freed them from the bondage to slavery and death in Egypt Remember, the Passover is actually where God shows mercy to a people who are sinful and don't deserve it, but he has promised to and he will deliver to. The Sabbath day is the Passover. It is where God simply calls you to gather around his table and receive his gifts and not worry for once about death and not worry for once about suffering. Gather around his meal and understand God is with you here. So what can be against you? God is with you here. So you don't have to be afraid of the devil. You don't have to be afraid of the world. You don't even have to be afraid of your own sinful flesh because God is working to, to conquer all three of those things and give you life and life abundantly. Uh, you can do this by the sheep gate. Uh, that there was in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethsaida. Um, the sheep gate was where they brought in the animals to the temple to be sacrificed. Uh, and, and again, that, that our Lord, the good shepherd, would work by the sheep gate where there are um, sheep going through to be sacrificed uh, at an altar dedicated to him. Again, you can do this by, by your works or, or by, by God's works. Uh, what does God need a dead lamb for, though? If God was hungry, he wouldn't ask you. I think that's in the psalm somewhere. If you really sort of think, like, because I gave you this animal, God, you won't be mad at me for this thing that I did, uh, that that's literally the definition of a vending machine. Put in money. I guess money instead of dead lamb. Don't put a body part of a lamb into a vending machine for chips. Uh, regardless, whew. <laughs> it's not a give and get. It's simply a God has established a system that would point to 
the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, the very same Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world that Je or John the Baptist pointed at in the person of Jesus and said, look, this is the ultimate sacrifice. This is the sacrifice that all of those sacrifices point to. This is the Lamb who will come in by the sheep gate, who will bleed and die outside of the city for all of his people. Upon him will be the chastisement that brings us peace. This is Jesus. And again, it's God who gave the people the lambs and set up the system by which the blood of somebody else could be spilled to forgive your sin. Because really, if it were to be a proper sacrifice, uh, it, it should be a more deathish kind of cult. Uh, a, a, a proper sacrifice really ought to be the people who cause the harm have to bleed, right? Um, but God in his mercy says, no, I want to send forth a lamb to bleed for you so that you don't have to. This is the gift that God gives you. That, that he would take upon himself and his creation, the product of, of your sin, and he would bring it to nothing, and he would give you simply grace. All of it. All of it is God working on the Sabbath day for you. The Sabbath day is not about doing no work. In fact, the most wonderful thing in the world happens on the Sabbath day. God does work for you. Go to church. Uh, we should fear and love God so that we do not despise preaching and his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear it and learn it. Who do you think's getting work done on the Sabbath day? Like, you can make the joke about pastors got to work all holidays, but uh, understand who's preaching. It's God who is working the forgiveness of sins through your pastor. It's God who has instituted his table that you would eat and drink there for the forgiveness of sins. It is God who sets up this temple uh, that, that is the, the, the gathering around Jesus, who is brought to you through the means of grace by the Holy Spirit, that here, by, by his work, you would receive mercy. You would receive pardon. Uh, God works on the Sabbath day, and it's going to upset a whole bunch of people because this man who was healed, now he's implicit in it. See, it's not just Jesus that technically broke the rules of don't do stuff on the Sabbath. Uh, by rules, I don't mean God's law, but I mean the man-made rules that were sort of attached to it. Uh, the, the Jews, the Pharisees, the, the scribes, they had attached all these extra rules to the Sabbath about not doing stuff. And so you'll see them argue with Jesus a whole bunch on the Sabbath day about the miracles that he's doing. And Jesus is allowed to because, after all, the Sabbath day is sort of where God comes to you to give you rest, comes to you to give you uh, mercy, comes to you to do work for you that, that you would rest in his presence this man is implicit because he's told take up his own bed and that's a no-no absolutely not don't take up your sick bed um from the perspective of, of the pharisees this is is forbidden uh but from the lord's gospel it, it actually becomes a celebration uh this man is told to pick up the thing that that had to to carry him uh pick up th th this this shell that held your, your sinfulness and recognize that it's empty now. There, there is no cup full of sin. There's only a cup full of grace. It, it becomes a celebration for this man to pick up his sickbed because he doesn't need it anymore. And so even as he carries it, he rejoices in the Lord's gift. Uh, this is, this is a, a wonderful testimony that, that's going to actually uh, upset people on down the line. Because, well, when, uh, when he was healed, he took up his bed, and he walked, and that day was the Sabbath. And so they see him walking around with his sick bed. And the thing that they zero in on is, uh, is not that he was healed. It is not lawful for you to take up your bed. See, they're not even happy that he's healed. They're like, ah, whatever just happened here, the real issue, the thing that we should be talking about is this man is carrying a mat. This is, this is cause for alarm. I understood that for 38 years he laid there begging for mercy and like we were there and didn't help him. I don't want to talk about that. Uh, 38 years he was there begging for mercy, but, but you know, at least he, he was still on the Sabbath because of the paralysis. The real issue that we need to punish is that he's carrying a mat. Really? <laughs> Who is the man that told you to do this thing? He is a sinner. Who would dare to tell you to take up your bed and walk on the Sabbath day? It's Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath. Uh, it's Jesus. That, that's a good thing. All right, let's, uh, let's transition a little bit. Um, what's going to come from this is that... Uh, the Jews will, will then uh, seek all the more to kill Jesus, not only because he was breaking the Sabbath day, but because he was even calling God his own father and making himself equal to God. So uh, let, let's get into this, and I want to do it two ways. Uh, uh, 
a, a kind of a beginner's way and a more advanced way, a child's way and a grown-up's way, a milk and a meat. Uh, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing, and greater works than these he will show him so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to all whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has given judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. Let's back up. So, what we have here is, is a little, maybe not diatribe, uh, a, a, little, um, a little sermon about Jesus and how he relates to the Father. So, he, he, he claims here very clearly through a, a number of, of ways to be uh, co-equal with the Father. He claims to have the same works of the Father and the same will of the Father. He even claims to be able to, to give forth the Father's judgment alone. He has the same honor to the Father. He speaks with the same voice uh, that the Father would speak. Uh, he is equal to the Father, for he is the Son of God, not less than the Father, but equal to the Father. Uh, and so when we talk about God's unity, uh, we... We tend to actually, in, in like our catechism, for example, uh, break it up into the three persons of the Trinity. And so uh, in the Apostles' Creed, you have, uh, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, creator. Uh, let's go boop, 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 oh, too big, boop, 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 boop. If I boop while I do it, it's, I don't know. Uh, we, we talk about this along the lines of the Apostles' Creed. God, the Father, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And so to the Son belongs redemption. And then finally, at last, the Holy Spirit is not just sort of the junk drawer that's in your kitchen full of all the leftover stuff that we know we need to include. This is where the Holy Spirit works. I believe in the Holy Spirit, uh, namely where I can find the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Uh, this is not wrong. This is not wrong at all. Uh, but it's also a little bit narrow uh, because Jesus just uh, got done telling us that, uh, well, the Son does the same works as the Father. Uh, the, the Son does the, the same works as the Father. And so, um, when, when we deal with this, uh, we might actually want to use the Athanasian Creed. The Athanasian Creed, that big long one that you only do on Trinity Sunday, uh, your pastor uh, might even dare let you sit down for it uh, because it's so, so long. Uh, it, it's, it's a wonderful creed. Uh, and to it, we actually have a, a better glimpse maybe into the economy of the, crinomy, uh, the, economy of the Trinity. Because there, uh, when uh, the confessors of, of the Athanasian Creed uh, want to distinguish between the persons of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, who are not three gods but one God, uh, they would distinguish them this way. The Father was not made, nor created, nor begotten. The Son was neither made, nor created, but begotten of the Father alone. And the Holy Spirit is of the Father and of the Son, neither made, nor created, not more, nor no Arians here, y'all. Uh, nor created, nor begotten, but proceeding. Um, so, that means that when we deal with creation, it wasn't that the Father alone created and the Son just sort of sat idly by. After all, uh, in the beginning, the Spirit hovered over the, the face of the deep. You, you see that very clearly in Genesis. But also, what was it, after all, that spoke creation into existence but the Word? which was made flesh to dwell among us, Jesus. The whole of the Trinity was at work inside of creation. Now, we attribute this, yes, chiefly to the person of the Father, but understand that, that uh, this, the, the Son can do nothing without the Father, and, and the Father can do nothing w without the Son. Uh, for whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. It's, it's the scriptures right here. Uh, John uh, 5... 19. Whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. That means that the Father is creating, the Son's right there too, and also redemption. It's not that sort of Jesus took it upon himself to save you from an angry father. 
it's that the entirety of the Trinity was at work inside of the the resurrect uh, the the passion that would save you. Uh, it, it was the Father who sent the Son. It, it was the Son who who bled and died. It is the Holy Spirit who sends forth this this forgiveness in word and sacrament to you. Um, and in the same way that the sanctifier, the Holy Spirit is, is not just sort of like discount God that you get because you born were born too late to see real Jesus. The Holy Spirit actually brings you Jesus so much so that I can say the Father's mercy is given to you in baptism. Jesus is baptism. We just got done saying that. All of the Trinity works together inside of this. And so the Apostles' Creed is not wrong. Uh, it's just sort of how we start to teach our children. And then as they get a little bit older, we'll say, now, look, you can look in the scriptures and you can see the Son was present in your creation too. The Father was part of your redemption. The Holy Spirit was, was there in all of it. Uh, so when we would distinguish between the, the Trinity, we would simply say, well, I know the difference between a father and a son. Uh, the Father is not begotten. The Son is begotten. Begotten. Uh, it's like born, but for men. Because, like, my, my son isn't born of me. He, he's begotten from me because I can't give birth because male. Uh, and we do ascribe to those gender roles. Uh, <laughs> the economy of the Trinity is simply how God works in relation to himself. And here Jesus starts to expound upon it. Uh, this is where we'll probably pick up uh, tomorrow. You'll have one more day with me. And we'll probably finish out uh, John chapter 5. Uh, Jesus doesn't always uh, doesn't simply just claim to be divine, but he claims to do it in, in, in specific ways. Um, and so we'll, we'll start to take a look at this and recognize that as Jesus is going through these things, uh, he, he's holding himself in relation to the Father. And he, he is also showing you, uh, proceeding, yes, coming from, uh, sent by, might even be. Uh, the, the way that you want to talk about this in terms of, of the Holy Spirit. Uh, sorry, Eric, I was uh, peeking at other stuff. So, um, yeah, who, who's proceeding? Um, in other words, uh, he, he's, he's also the one who comes to bring you the others. Uh, so so if, he, if, if he is uh, proceeding beforehand, then when the Holy Spirit comes, he brings with me, or brings with him, Jesus. The Father and the Son send Jesus and the Father that through the gifts of the Holy Spirit you would receive, Jesus and the Father. Good. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, stick around with uh, me tomorrow. Pastor Borghart will be back with you Wednesday. Uh, thank you all for, for tuning in. Uh, Lord bless you and keep you. Grant you a great day. Bye-bye.